I'm Valerie Amos, I'm the Director of SOAS, and I really am delighted to welcome you uh, this evening to our panel discussion on human rights futures. This is very much uh, an issue which is at the heart of who we are at SOAS and uh, what we're about. And I'm going to hand you over to Professor Hopgood, who's the Pro Director International, who will introduce the panel and moderate tonight's debate. Thank you all very much indeed uh, for being here. Thank Stephen. You. Um, just to say, Helena Kennedy will join us, but she's in the House of Lords voting on uh, data protection amendments, so she will race here as soon as she's finished, but for the moment we're going to start with an empty seat uh, here. Can I welcome you um, to SOAS? It's fantastic to see so many people here, wonderful audience. Um, I'm going to make a few announcements. Uh, and say something very briefly about the book and then just introduce my fellow panellists uh, and then we'll uh, proceed with, as it were, our critics who are going to make a couple of remarks about the book. Uh, Leslie and Jack will respond. I'm just going to chair tonight. I'm going to try to not say anything <laughs> substantive, but we'll see how that goes. And, and then we'll, as quickly as we can, move to a Q&A with the audience um, as well. Uh, tonight's... Uh, event is, is sponsored by the Center on Conflict Rights and Justice, which Leslie is the director of, and the Center for International Studies and Diplomacy at SOAS, their International Relations Speaker Series, which Leslie is also the chair. Um, so we'd like to thank both those organizations for putting this event on. Books will be available, paperbacks, and I promise you we managed to pressure Cambridge into accelerating the production of a paperback on the basis of this event. So we're looking for good sales. Uh, and an extra, an extra selling point, you will probably never get the three editors in the same room again. This is the first time we've been together. So if you want to get all three of us to sign your book, now is the time to buy a copy. Okay? Okay, very good. There's also going to be a reception afterwards. So once we've uh, had the event, there'll be um, some soft drinks and some wine outside. We'll sign books for you. We'll talk to you uh, um, afterwards. Uh, so please stay around for the reception um, too. Okay. Um, right, cover that, cover that, cover that. The book itself took us altogether maybe three years to produce, starting with a workshop here and then another workshop in New York. Um, we had a very clear idea in mind, which was to produce, a, if you like, a one-stop shop for thinking about human rights, particularly from a scholarly perspective. All of us had published on human rights before, but what we thought we'd do was invite a series of people from very different traditions within human rights scholarship to come together to argue out their various positions, not to reach a consensus, but to produce a book which, as you'll see, moves from the outset where we have chapters by Catherine Sinkik and Jeff Dancy and Beth Simmons, um, which are, and uh, Anton Streznev. Beth Simmons and Catherine Sinkik in particular are probably the most prominent scholars internationally of, as it were, the progressive account of human rights that they've been very effective and can continue being very effective. The middle of the book is then a whole series of people, Jack and Leslie, uh, Thomas Risser, uh, 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 Shireen Hurtle and others, looking at difficulties with the rights project, why it works in some places and not others, what kind of pushback there is against that. So not exactly saying the rights project may be deeply um, uh, flawed in, in some uh, uh, sense, but these are the things that those advocating human rights have to think about in order to make the project more effective. And then the book ends with Samuel Moyne and myself, uh, who are effectively arguing that there really are deep structural flaws within the Human Rights Project for a variety of reasons. And so if you make it that far uh, and you still have some optimism, you'll, you know, that, uh, yeah, you'll, you'll need to gird yourselves before you um, uh, go through the final two chapters. <laughs> and then we, we frame that with an introduction and a conclusion. The, con the introduction 
is a sort of state of the art of human rights scholarship. The conclusion, and Jack and I were just talking about this, actually comes up with four possible futures for human rights. And we think they stand up pretty well. They're not didactic, they're designed to start a conversation, but about where we may be heading uh, within the framework of a world which is clearly changing uh, reasonably rapidly. So that's the book. As I say, copies will be available afterwards and we'll happily sign them for you. Let me just introduce the panelists and then we'll move straight on to comments from David and Joanne. Uh, Helena Kennedy I'll just, is principal of Mansfield College. She's exceptionally well known in British legal circles. She led the attempt to fund a, um, a human rights institute at Mansfield, the Bonavera Human Rights Institute, but she's been a barrister for more than 40 years. Uh, she's a Labour peer in the House of Lords alongside our esteemed director, uh, Baroness Amos. Uh, I did read that Helena Kennedy is the worst, most, the, the uh, Labour peer who dissents most from Labour motions in the House of Lords, it's in, in her Wikipedia entry. Anyway, so <laughs> when she comes, we don't need to introduce her, now, you know who she is. Uh, on my left here is Jack Snyder, who's the Robert and Rene Belfair Professor of International Relations in the Political Desi uh, Science Department at Columbia University. Jack is, has published hugely both books and journal articles. Jack is one of the top uh, international relations political scientists in the world. We're very uh, uh, lucky to have him here tonight. Uh, I could go on endlessly about his many achievements, but he, I'll just mention that he's also a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, Leslie is Director of the Centre on Conflict Rights and Justice, uh, asso an Associate Professor in International Relations at SOAS and Chair of the International Relations Speaker Series. She uh, too has numerous publications, uh, both journal articles and books, but many of you will be familiar with her as she's become extremely um, uh, visible on CNN, Bloomberg, BBC News and a whole array of um, uh, international news outlets commenting on contemporary international politics, transatlantic uh, foreign policy and things of this sort. Uh, David, uh, no, Joanne's next. Joanne is a senior uh, crisis response advisor at Amnesty International who's investigated human rights violation, violations around the world documenting war crimes in Afghanistan, Colombia and South Sudan, political violence in Burundi and Haiti, and prison conditions in the United States, Venezuela and Hong Kong. She also is a regular um, guest on international uh, media, and before working at Amnesty, she worked for um, Human Rights Watch in New York. And finally, uh, David Mepham is Director of Human Rights Watch UK, um, uh, responsible for advocacy towards the UK government, um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Parliament, oh, I think I may have mixed things up there, so I'm going to leave that. He was previously Head of Policy and Advocacy at Save the Children UK, and before that worked for the Department of, um, uh, for International Development and worked with um, Valerie Amos uh, 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 when he was in the government. So that's your panel. The way in which we're going to proceed is I'm going to ask, uh, I'll ask uh, Joanne to go first and then David. Um, they're going to give a response to the book. They've had a copy for a couple of months, so they're going to give their response to the book. And this, we, you know, we're reasonably tough, so this may well be a very critical response to the book. Then I'll ask, and I'll, I'll give them five minutes each, I'll ask Jack and Leslie to share the five minutes response to that. And then I'm going to ask one or two questions and get all the panellists to engage with those. So thank you very much for indulging my introduction, and I'll hand over to Joanne. Thank you very much for the invitation to participate in what I'm certain is going to be a really interesting discussion. Um, I actually thought I was going to be the last panelist to speak uh, in sort of presenting the book and the future of human rights, and partially out of fear that everything interesting about the book would have been said, I thought I would supplement a discussion of the book with my view uh, sort of from the ground, because as... Um, was indicated I really work in the field and do research on human rights more than sort of academic scholarship and advocacy. But sort of my view of trends that I've seen and that I believe are going to be crucial to the future of human rights and I think will um, really uh, indicate fundamental changes that might 
respond to some of the critiques in the book. But just you know, to start off about the book, I definitely appreciated the, um, the critique of the, of the human rights movement from several angles. I think there's a tendency to see a well-intentioned movement as something of a sacred cow and <coughs> hesitance to criticize it thoroughly and um, you know, sincerely. And the book didn't hold its punches, um, as a, a you know, few previous books haven't either. And I really think the concerns in the book merit attention, and I would love to see some kind of workshop by which scholars could engage with actual human rights practitioners such as myself and think you know, more broadly about the human rights movement in ways that we generally don't have the time and the fora to do. So I would encourage you to try to, to develop that. Um, I think you know, the, the most profound critique of the book is that it raises questions as to whether the rights paradigm is suited for a rapidly changing world and indeed whether the rights paradigm will remain relevant as the world changes. So what I want to briefly sketch out are my thoughts on the way the rights paradigm itself and particularly the human rights movement is changing um, in hopeful directions, positive directions that I think will um, maybe obviate some of the critiques of the book. And, you know, I should be clear, my position is as a longtime staffer, first at Human Rights Watch for well over a decade and now at Amnesty for about five years. Uh, so I'm going to focus on those organizations, something as, you know, bellwethers of larger trends in the human rights movement. The first important trend I want to um, underscore is the real meaningful globalization of the movement away from the asymmetrical model of the past. And when I say asymmetrical, what I refer to is particularly at the transnational... Um, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I thought red was on. Now I can hear myself better. Um, the, the asymmetrical model that I was referring to is the idea that in the past, um, what you would see would be international human rights groups based in Western capitals, namely London and New York City, staffed by white Ivy League graduates, often not fluent in the language of the countries that they are visiting, going on what were referred to as missions, which has a lot of connotations, you know, field missions. You'd spend two or three weeks in the country, generally at most. You would engage with local activists, you know, you would hire a translator to fixer, and you would learn as much as you could about abuses going on in that country, then you would return to your Western capital, write a report, and launch it hopefully with a lot of publicity uh, and gain the attention of the Western, you know, that certainly the focus was on the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Guardian, the Western media, and try to get Western govern governments to lobby to change the abusive patterns that were documented in the report. And, you know, I'm maybe slightly caricaturing, but not a whole lot. And as you can see, I think this model veered sometimes dangerously close to the Western white savior complex of, um, you know, sort of exoticizing what were seen as brutal places abroad and not looking critically at your own abuses. I think this has really changed a lot. Um, and interestingly, the book raises the question of whether the human rights movement could be a casualty of the decline of the West. I, in contrast, think that the you know, sort of increasing democratization of global space is strengthening the human rights movement tremendously. Um, as you may have heard, both Human Rights Watch and Amnesty have, in recent years, taken really important steps towards diversifying their locations of their offices geographically. So it's no longer the London headquarters and people being sent abroad. It's people based abroad. It's people who were born abroad. Um, it's people documenting abuses in the country in which they live, in the region in which they live. Um, so the Amnesty and Human Rights Watch have significantly decreased staff in the headquarters and expanded very much the presence abroad. And Amnesty now has offices in Dakar, Johannesburg, Mexico City, Lima, um, uh, Bangkok, to name a few. And I think you know, this is important both symbolically and practically in terms of proximity uh, 
to the places in which you work um, and also leveling the playing field in which, you know, London is also a place in which we work in which we document abuses, as is New York. Um, I think it's also important um, practically and, and even more important is the diversification of the staff. So in parallel with that diversification of offices, we see that um, organizations that were previously primarily staffed by white Westerners with Ivy League educations are now much more heterogeneous. They are racially, ethnically, linguistically diverse. They have people from really a range of national origins. And I think most interestingly, often people who are bicultural, people who are perfectly bilingual and perfectly at home in more than one culture. Um, so um, I guess I'd emphasize that these changes have started at the researcher level. They started at the level of, you know, sort of the staffers who document abuses and who do the, the, the you know, layman's work of advocating for change. But they've slowly been going up the chain of command in the organizations and have reached the senior director level. And just as uh, sort of a, a bellwether or a, a benchmark, I would make a prediction. Um, in 1993, when Arya Nair handed over the reins of Human Rights Watch to Ken Roth, um, you know, it was basically one New Yorker handing over the reins of international human rights, you know, one of the very leading organizations, to another. Ivy League educated New Yorker. Um, I very much doubt when Ken Roth decides to leave Human Rights Watch that you'll see a similar change, that you'll see you know, a white male uh, take, take over the organization. Um, both at Human Rights Watch and at Amnesty, you see many more people of color and people with very diverse backgrounds and very diverse sets of influences in position of power and authority. Um, there are also efforts to diversify both organizations' fundraising. And anyone who is not entirely naive about how organizations function know that funders and sources of funding are important. So I think this, too, will help diversify the, the attention of, of the human rights movement. Um, and I guess also I, I want to really emphasize that these aren't just changes in packaging. Um, these changes really affect the substance of the organization's work. They help broaden the organization's constituencies and make them more responsive to a broader range of concerns. So, I mean, many have noted an increasing focus by human rights organizations away from a narrow focus on political and, and civil rights to economic, social, and cultural rights. I think that diversification of the staff is part of, you know, part of that change. Um, and similarly, the move toward greater scrutiny of abuses by, you know, very namely the U.S. government, but other Western governments as well. And it's hard to imagine now, but until about 1999, Human Rights Watch did not even have a program that covered the United States. Um, the first time I saw a Human Rights Watch speaker give a talk, they were explaining why it was unnecessary for Human Rights Watch to document abuses in the United States. Well, now the organization has a vibrant U.S. program that's you know, very active and very, very well staffed. Um, the second trend I'd, I'll quickly outline is similar in terms of diversification, but here it's a diversification, diversification of skills and expertise. Um, the human rights movement I think is very marked by the predominance of lawyers and prosecutorial and lawyerly approaches to narratives. What we've been seeing though in the past decade especially is a, a much broader range of skills uh, of, and of backgrounds of people getting involved in human rights. So there's the, the field, the fast developing field that some of you may have heard of, of forensic architecture, which brings expertise in spatial analysis and satellite imagery um, and, and even physics to the fore. Um, certainly design and visual and aesthetic skills. You have many more photographers and videographers and web designers on staff of human rights organizations. Um, we have military arms experts now who are able to forensically trace uh, the origins of, of um, military weaponry. You have statisticians, 
computer scientists. It's just a much greater range of skills, and I think this too really affects the focus and the substance of the organization's work because you know when you have a hammer, as we all know, everything looks like a nail. When people have a whole range of skills, they have the ability to rely on different methodologies, and I think that you know allows them to find new models for affecting change. Um, the final trend that I'm just going to briefly uh, describe is the increasing democracy of communications. So, you know, in the original model of the human rights uh, research and methodology I mentioned at the outset, you would visit a country, come back with the information, rely on the media to do the actual dissemination to the broader public. Those steps have now been collapsed, and we have real-time monitoring that happens, and real-time and direct dissemination. So, I mean, I, I lament the decline of the media for many reasons, but I do applaud or, you know, see great benefit to the ability for human rights activists to reach the public directly. And also not, for local human rights activists, not to rely on international organizations to reach an international public. Local activists in Burundi and other places now can reach, you know, can reach you directly. And that is happening more and more. And I think it brings a lot of new information and a lot of new ideas to the field. So I'm optimistic. Thank you very much, Joy. <laughs> David. Thank you very much. So I stick with green. I don't move to red. Is that right? Yeah, green's good. Okay. Well, Joanna's mentioned Human Rights Watch quite a few times in her, her own remarks. I was kind of wondering whether there was, there was much more for me to say. But I will, uh, I'll give a few uh, thoughts. In the, I think I've got five minutes in this opening yeah. segment, uh, yeah. Stephen. So I'll, um, if, you, if you'll forgive me, in terms of my five minutes, I'll, I'll come to the book, which I know you're very keen for, for me to do, and I'll give three quick reflections on the book. Yeah, Human Rights Futures. Human Rights University. Futures, yes, absolutely. <laughs> But I think it's important, perhaps in front of this audience, I don't know, I, I guess there's primarily, primarily students in the audience, but maybe a range of, of academics and others here too, just to give two examples of the work that Human Rights Watch is doing, perhaps make this assumption that you know what Amnesty and Human Rights Watch and organisations of our kind do, but perhaps I could give two very quick examples and I'd be really succinct, and they're quite different examples actually. The first is Yemen, which some of you will know is an extremely poor country underneath Saudi Arabia, which has been involved in a brutal war for the last couple of years, a war between a Saudi Arabian-led coalition. Saudi Arabia is by far and away the largest party, but it's got a number of Arab states alongside it, waging a war against the Houthi rebel opposition group. That war has been going on since March 2015. It's extremely brutal. It's killed over 5,000 people. Over 8,500 people have been injured. I think the thing that brings this back to, to the UK, where we're having this conversation, is that the Saudi Arabian-led coalition has been substantially armed by the British government, the British government has sold over £4 billion worth of arms since the start of the conflict in March 2015. It's also armed by the French and the Americans. And Human Rights Watch has been involved. I mean, there's some, some sort of, I think, mischaracterization sometimes by some of the contributors to the report about the way in which organizations like Human Rights Watch operate. But what we've done in Yemen, working very closely with local partners, is to try to establish the extent to which both parties to the conflict, the Houthis and the Saudi Arabian-led coalition, are violating the laws of war. So, the laws of war is, is that sort of parallel strand of law that sits alongside international human rights law. You have international human rights law and you have international humanitarian law, the laws of war, some of which actually precedes the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. So there's a substantial body of law that's been assembled that talks about the way in which warring parties can, can conduct war. And the critical thing is actually they should distinguish and differentiate between legitimate military targets, combatants and legitimate military sites and civilians. And what we've seen through our research, on the ground research, working with local partners as well as through satellite imagery, is there have been many, many occasions in which both the Houthi opposition group and the Saudi-led coalition that we are supporting are violating the laws of war by hitting mosques and markets and schools and hospitals in the way that has killed and injured many, many civilians. So we've done a lot of work on that and we continue to press that very hard with the, with the British government in, in my case, but also the Human Rights Council and the UN Security Council. It's been an uphill struggle because the UK is very heavily invested in the Saudi government, but I think we've had some impact at the recent Human Rights Council in getting that Human Rights Council to agree to an international inquiry into violations by all parties to the conflict in terms of who's responsible for what and what's going on, ensuring a degree of accountability. So Yemen, a kind of crisis, conflict-affected state, is one example 
of work that we and Amnesty and many others do. A very different example, which I want to put on the table because I think, again, perhaps challenges some of the mischaracterizations about the breadth of our agenda, is work that we've done at Human Rights Watch on disability rights. Now, I think it's fair to say that perhaps you know, the mainstream human rights movement, the big international organizations, came quite late to disability rights. There were many local organizations, clearly, that were working on this issue for a long time. In our own case, we've only re relatively recently started a disability rights program, but we're extremely active and extremely energetic in identifying a whole range of rights violations suffered by people with disabilities, working with local groups across the world. And one issue I want to flag for you tonight, which we've been very active on, which I think is hugely important and significant, is the phenomenon of shackling. And it's hard to believe in the 21st century in 2018 that there are many people with disabilities who are locked up for years and years and years because their families and their communities believe they are possessed by kind of evil, evil spirits. And there, there are examples that we've come across in Ghana and Indonesia where scores of people were held, in one case a man who was held for 15 years, literally chained to a tree, given food and water but no other medical assistance. We, working with local partners, helped to expose that barbarity, I can't think of another word to describe it, that horrendous inhumane treatment. Working with the governments of Ghana and Indonesia, we've, we've actually ensured that there is a commitment on the part of both governments to actually address that problem, to unshackle the disabled people that were shackled and to put in place medical health, mental health services appropriate for people uh, facing the, the disabilities that they face. So two very diff different examples, a conflict-affected case and a, and a case of disability rights that we're very active on. And of course, an organization like ours, like Amnesty, is working on many, many different countries around the world and on many, many thematic issues. Let me turn quickly to some very quick, succinct points on, uh, on the book itself, which I really enjoyed. I think it's a huge contribution to the debate. And I, like Joanne, I welcome, and Human Rights Watch welcomes, you know, energetic, vigorous, robust debate about where the human rights movement is going and what our strengths are and what our weaknesses are, the impact we're having, the impact we're not having. I think that's a debate that we should all enter, enter into honestly. Uh, but let me say this in terms of my first point. I, I would firmly plank my flag on the camp of the people that argue that there has been progress in respect of human rights and that the human rights organizations of which you know, I represent one has contributed to that impact. I think some of the contributors to the volume are pretty skeptical about whether there's been progress and whether human rights organizations are making more than a negligible, negligible impact. I'm very much of the view on the basis of my own experience with Human Rights Watch in the last seven years that we are having impact. And I agree, I think, very strongly with Catherine Sakink's chapter in the volume that talks about some of the objective indicators that she's referenced that suggest there's been progress overall in respect of advancement on, on critical human rights issues, both civil and political and economic and social. I think it's important to be specific. So let me just give you on this impact question, let me just give you some examples, just in the last year, in 2017, of impact affecting just one area of human rights. This is just the area of children's rights. We work on a whole range of other thematic issues and a whole range of other country situations, but just on children's rights, in the course of 2017, these things have happened, which I would say were progress. The UN, as some of you will know, certainly uh, our distinguished, uh, what are you, the, prince of, the principal of SOAS will know this extremely well. The UN publishes a list of shame of countries around the world that actively recruit children into their armed forces. It's a very important thing that the UN does. I think it's published by the UN Secretary General on an annual basis. Last year, the Democratic Republic of Congo, where as we all know, there's been years and years of vicious conflict, the DRC was taken off that list. The UN concluded that the DRC's own armed forces were no longer actively recruiting children into its, ar into its army. I would say that that was progress. In the case of the United States, and no doubt we'll talk a lot about the US in the course of this conversation tonight, there are awful things going on with President Trump, we all know that. But in the case of the United States, in 2017, the states of Arkansas, California, New Jersey, and North Dakota all banned sentences of life without parole for child offenders. That's an issue that we've been really actively involved in for over 10 years. The sort of absurdity of a child of 13 or 14 committing, in many cases, a serious crime, but having a life sentence with no parole. That has been overturned in four important states in the United States, and I think in part due to the work that we've done. Um, and one other issue, just to flag you, in the course of 2017, the, the Indian Supreme Court ruled that sex with a child bride is rape. Previously, people have been able to argue that it was no such thing. I would say that all of those examples of impact that we have helped contribute to, working with local partners, were real progress that we should celebrate. That's not to say there aren't many more challenges that we're facing, but that's an example of, they are examples of progress that we should recognize and welcome. Second quick point, and I, this I think builds on some of the points that Jack Snyder made in his chapter in the book. I agree with you, Jack, I think if I read your chapter correctly, 
that going forward the human rights movement needs to think much more politically about the country context in which it operates and the way it seeks to bring about change. I think we need a deeper political, social, cultural analysis of the countries where we're trying to affect change. And I'm, I'm not saying that we never do that now. I'm not saying that's not something we've got better at in recent years, but I think that's something we need to invest much more heavily in if we're trying to affect change around the world. Of course, it applies to our own country too. It applies to the UK. And actually, I could just flag this with you as a point of interest. Just last year, about six months ago, the London Office of Human Rights Watch, which I had it head up, did something we'd never done before. We actually commissioned a communications agency that carries out opinion polling and focus group work to do some focus groups for us to try to ascertain where middle Britain was in its attitude to human rights, what it thought human rights were, whether it thought human rights were a good thing or a bad thing, which human rights it liked, which human rights it didn't like, what its concerns were about human rights. And I think that has helped to inform the thinking that we do about UK-focused advocacy in the coming period. So I, I agree with you, we need a more political analysis. You also talk a lot about the need to build a bigger mass, mass movement for human rights, and I think that's true. Obviously, there is a challenge between, if you like, a more established democracy like the UK and an authoritarian or an undemocratic society. You also talk a lot about political parties, and I think there are some challenges for Human Rights Watch, which has, a, you know, has charitable status, at least part of what we do has charitable status in the UK, in getting too involved in kind of party political work. But I don't dissent from your basic premise that in difficult environments around the world, in undemocratic societies and societies in transition, there needs to be much more effort made to try to encourage mass mobilisation and a bigger public constituency behind the objective of human rights. Third point, really quickly, I promise, is about economic and social rights. Again, I think there's a bit of a misunderstanding that organisations like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty, and I think you, Joanne, very effectively corrected this in what you said, that we don't work on economic and social rights. We have done four years. It's interesting, a number of people, I think, Jack, you might have referenced what Ken Roth said about 15 years ago in, a, in one article. But actually, if you look at our website, we have a host of work on, on education and the right to education and a huge amount of work on the right to health. So these are big, important areas for us that we value. But I think it's fair to say, going forward, that it's uh, areas of work that we should do more on and we should give more attention to and publicise more. I think it is true to say that when Human Rights Watch and possibly Amnesty previously talk about their work, they tend to talk about the crisis work or they talk about civil and political rights and we haven't given as much attention to our economic and social rights work. But that's not because we're not doing it. But I think going forward, perhaps particularly, and perhaps I'll close on this, in the context of the whole populism debate that no doubt we'll talk more about in the course of this evening, I think it, there are a whole series of factors that contributed to populism, and let's not pretend there's a simple explanation for it. But I think a sense on the part of certain groups of people that they were left behind by economic progress, that they were suffering economic disadvantage, um, that wasn't being attended to or listened to or recognised, I think that has contributed in some way to the rise of populism. So I think giving more attention to economic and social rights, perhaps particularly affecting those communities, can be part of the way in which we try to challenge the challenge and the threat posed by populism. I'll finish there. Thank you, David. I'm going to ask Les and Jack to respond briefly, and then I'm going to ask a couple of questions of all the panellists. While they're responding, I'm going to check my phone, not because I'm not engaged, but because I want to check whether Baroness Kennedy is on her way or whether maybe she said she's not going to make it. So I apologise for that. Leslie, would you like to go first? Or would you like... Jack was going to go, yeah. OK, great. Happy to. Um, thank you so much, uh, Joanne and David, for those uh, great comments, which, uh, if I have time, uh, will help lead me into a number of the themes. Two of or three the, minutes, the, Jack. The, oh, oh, two <laughs> or three minutes, OK. When an uh, academic says, if I have time. <laughs> yeah. So, um, th Joanne, your point about um, the, uh, human rights, uh, the, the human rights movement becoming more glo global and not asymmetric, uh, north speaking to south as it was before. Uh, let me just uh, give an anecdote from a meeting that I helped organize in Amman, Jordan in August, uh, where we were discussing with people who were uh, human rights scholars and uh, activists from all over the Middle East, the reform of the UN treaty bodies system. And in looking for people to invite to this meeting, uh, 
we found it rather difficult to find people who were not extremely well socialized into the international way of thinking about human rights. And often I felt like we were having the same conversation in Amman as we had just had the previous month in New York City. So it was a way of being still very global and standard while having people who were from the region, except for a few people who were sort of at the fringes of this socialization. And sometimes they said things that were quite different and that challenged the conventional wisdom. Uh, we had a professor from Al-Azhar University in Cairo, the premier uh, Sunni uh, institution of higher education in the world. Uh, who was a really heroic guy who had spent his whole career working on uh, women's health and rights issues in Egypt and East Africa. Uh, and his approach had been to use a combination of uh, public health and medical strategies. He was a medical doctor. Um, combined with religious education of what the Quran actually says about women's health uh, issues. And uh, he took the floor at one point to uh, complain about what other people in the room had been saying about how terrible it was that countries like Saudi Arabia had uh, signed uh, the CEDAW Women's Rights Treaty with reservations and, and how unacceptable it was given the universal nature of women's rights to, to uh, have these reservations. And he, he said, you know, uh, first of all, in my country, these are matters of religious belief. And secondly, he said, uh, you will take the tools out of my hands in struggling for women's health and women's rights if I cannot frame them in terms of the religious vernacular of uh, my society. So uh, the vernacularization of rights talk was one of the big themes in our book, Sally Mary's Chapter, among others. Um, and one of the unresolved issues in our book is the two-edged sword quality of vernacularization. On the one hand, talking about rights um, and progressive change in terms of the language of the society in which the persuasion is uh, being carried out can help get the idea across sometimes better than legalistic international language. But on the other hand, it can be a slippery slope. Um, Rachel Wall uh, is an American scholar who just published uh, a book on torture carried out by uh, Indian police who had had human rights training and who justified the torture of um, local suspects on the grounds that they were needed to do this to protect the human rights of the community from uh, bad people who were predators. Uh, so I think there's a lot more thinking that needs to be done about um, the shift from being global to uh, being vernacular. Um, I know my two minutes are up and I have... Do you want to write one more point? Um, so uh, let, me, let me make my points as okay. the conversation right. goes along. Right. Leslie. <clears throat> okay, I'll be very quick. First of all, thank you for, to everybody who's here tonight. It's, it's fabulous to look at and see uh, a lot of um, true experts and scholars who are at, just extremely um, knowledgeable and accomplished and have made very important statements in their work about human rights here in the audience. So we are by no means the only experts um, in, in the room, uh, and, and, and I hope that we'll hear from all of you. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the book was a long time in the making for a lot of 
complicated reasons. Perhaps one of the biggest ones is that it really is a book that brings together people who disagree quite seriously. And usually when you see edited books, it's, it's a lot of people who more or less agree and are trying to make a common statement. Certainly in the academy, they're trying to develop a common theoretical framework. And we knew from the get-go that that would be completely impossible. We weren't even certain that the three of us would be able to get through a joint introduction and conclusion, but we did. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was, you know, quite a, quite a tremendous accomplishment. I think it's wonderful that Steve is chairing, but don't let him off the hook because he's written one of the most interesting and very uh, most controversial chapters in the book. So he's he's fully open for questions. I think from from the audience. Um, but we also wrote the book at a time when a lot of the focus, in, and Joanne's comments um, re reflected this, was very much on the global south, on the Middle East, um, on the shrinking space for civil society and authoritarian pushback. It was just after the period that dominated the space when I arrived at SOAS in 2007, which was, all, which was actually a focus on the US because it was a focus on torture and, and a lot of people, especially people like Brad Adams who visited us from Human Rights Watch would say the biggest barrier that we face as Human Rights Watch in our advocacy around the world is the United States because when we stand up in China, they say, well, what about the United States? We then, when we, when we were working on this book, I think a lot of people were focused on Africa's pushback against the International Criminal Court, certainly I was, and a number of, a number of problems across, um, again, the global south and, and, and other parts of the world. And now, of course, we're in a, in a very different space where a lot of the conversation is about the West. A couple of the chapters, and I, and I want to say this and then comment very quickly on, on two of Joanne's points. Uh, several of the chapters are, are getting at this question of, and mine is, is included in this question of, to, to what extent does the backlash that we've seen um, have, will it have a lasting repercussion, or is it just temporary? And Catherine Sicking's chapter, she's, as you know, a leading scholar of human rights who's now based at Harvard, um, like to say in that chapter that, that David's acknowledged uh, that, you know, it's sort of, a, it's just a bump along the road and we're getting there and, and, you know, of course there are always setbacks. It's just a natural part of progress is that you have setbacks. So we shouldn't take the backlash too seriously. And there's a lot of pointing the, fig, the finger at very violent types of backlash and saying, you know, they go away. And what, what some of us tried to look at was not so much the violent types of backlash, atrocities, um, but at other kinds of backlash that were defined by leaders trying to undermine norms and to create new institutions, formal or informal, that fundamentally altered the relationship between the state and the state's autonomy and the individual and individual rights, and did it in a way that could create a new form of path dependence that over time would chip away at the fundamental premise and aspiration of human rights. And, and certainly when I wrote my chapter, I was thinking largely not about the US, although I did talk about the fact that you know, democracies do this and we saw you know, the torture memos and all sorts of things, and, but we did have civil society mobilization and a lot of international pushback as well as domestic pushback. And, and I'd say we're back to that space now where there's a lot of recognition that the things that we take for granted, the norms, um, as much, uh, are as significant as the more formal institutions in safeguarding human rights. So I think this conversation at back, of back, about backlash and its longer term uh, consequences and the forms that it takes is, is an extremely important one um, historically, but especially in the contemporary environment. So on Jan's two points about the democratization of space and global communications, I mean, I, I think it's very important and very significant the comments about the decentralization and the regionalization, the strategies that Amnesty and Human Rights Watch have pursued are impressive, they've been fascinating to watch, they're very significant um, as their global communications. But my, you know, my immediate reactions were, one, the democratization of space has also in the contemporary environment been accompanied by an absence, we know this, we hear it too much, but one can't but say it again, the absence of leadership the absence of an articulation of the liberal values um, coming out of the West. And some people, certainly at SOAS, would say, well, that's okay because it was always a project that was all about hypocrisy. But if you go back to Catherine Sickink's work, and she does have you know, the first substantive chapter in the book after the, the introduction, 
you know, their argument always, has always been that it doesn't matter if it's hypocrisy. The fact that you put the language out there creates the basis for weak actors in transitional states and authoritarian states to draw on that international language and framework and use it to put pressure on their governments to affect change. So if you buy that basic claim, then the absence of hypocrisy, and you think it's hypocrisy when, when, when liberal leaders in the West have historically put forward the language of rights and of democracy and of liberalism, then, then, it's, a, then it's, a prod, it's a problem for the liberal scholars who have contributed to the book that that, that that democratization of space has also been accompanied by an absence of leadership. On global communications, you know, one of my key concerns is the other part of the downside of global communications is what's happened in, the, in, the, in media, in social media, um, the echo chambers that we hear about, the siloed conversations that are taking place, and the demise of the editors, the moderators, and the intermediaries that have maintained a certain basic level of truth, of fact, of civilized discourse, and people moving into their silos in a way that makes it much more possible to, uh, to reinforce nativist sentiments and sectarian sentiments, and that I think is uh, that potentially works very much against the project of human rights, of liberalism, of civil society. And so I think that you know, the global communication space is one that's very problematic right now. There's certainly many good things, but there are some deeply problematic things that are, that are not on the side of human rights unless we repair and take, take care of them quickly, I think. I'll stop there. Leslie, thank you. Okay, I did have quite a complicated plan of asking various questions, getting more responses, but obviously time is already getting away from us. My sense is Baroness Kennedy will not make it, as she was still waiting quite uh, uh, recently to vote. Um, uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read out the three questions I was going to ask sequentially. I'm going to start with David and work along and ask our four panellists to make a brief comment on one or all of these questions as they see fit. And then I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience to the panel. So the three questions we were going to look at are, what have we learned from generations of human rights advocacy about the necessary requirements for its success? And what are the standout cases of that success? And, and both Joanne and, and David particularly have pointed some to some examples of that success. Secondly, is there significant pushback against human rights norms in the contemporary international system? And if so, what forms does it take? And is it a transient or permanent phenomenon? Leslie, to some degree, addressed that in her remarks. And Jack, bear, bear in mind the last part of that. Is it a transient or permanent phenomenon? If you look at my chapter in the book, I'm very pessimistic about the future for human rights in what I would describe as a post-Western world. Um, and so I think it's a permanent shift, but, but I'm probably the only person on this panel who would, who would argue that. The third question is, do current concerns about liberal democracies suggest alternatives to conventional rights approaches might be necessary, or that different strategies uh, need to be employed for progressive, uh, progressive change, different strategies to human rights strategies for progressive change? So I'll start with David. I'll ask you each to make a brief comment on one or all of those questions, and then I'll open the floor up to questions from the audience. David. Okay. So we don't need to take, necessarily take all of them. No, no, no. Just, no, pick no. One. just okay. take one if you want. Um, or maybe I'll take the one in advocacy. Sure. If that's okay. Absolutely. Um, so I think in terms of the lessons of, of, for success in terms of the advocacy that we've done in recent years, and arguably lessons uh, going forward, although we obviously need to adapt to change circumstances, I don't think the importance of meticulous research goes away. I think one of the strengths of Human Rights Watch and Amnesty and of human rights organisations is that we do actually invest a lot in the quality of the research and getting the facts and being clear about the facts and getting accuracy in respect to the facts is hugely important to our credibility. And I'm sure from time to time we make mistakes and I hope that when we do we own up to them and we apologise. But I think if we make mistakes too often, we make allegations about things happening which didn't happen or misrepresent or spin the facts, we'll get into very serious trouble. So I don't think that changes in the change context. I think the importance of researching being accurate and meticulous in our research remains a, a critical component of effective advocacy. I do think the whole communications story has changed a lot, and Leslie, you referenced this. I mean, we've not been at Human Rights Watch ashamed for a very long time about putting the media spotlight on the abuses that we document. We see that as an essential part of our theory of change. 
that it isn't enough just to have a quiet word in the ear of a policymaker. You actually have to shine the public spotlight, maximise your media coverage, maximise your communications exposure in order to get anybody to care about what you'll be working on and to do anything about it. So I don't think that changes either, but I think the social media, the media landscape, particularly social media, has changed so much that we all of us need to think more creatively about the way in which we use the media and the way we deal with the, some of the regressive uh, things that you referenced in terms of, you know, so there are other people who are very antithetical to human rights who are extremely good at using the media. And one of them sits in the White House, you know, who regularly uses Twitter at apparently 6.30 in the afternoon while eating a cheeseburger. Uh, so we need to be more, you know, to keep up with the people that hate human rights and everything that we stand for and are using social media and other kinds of media to do us down and to undermine liberal values and, uh, and attack human rights. We need to be, in a sense, cleverer, more creative, more experimental in the way in which we try to use different forms of media to draw attention to our issues. I do think there is a lot in this whole thing that a lot of us grapple with about telling stories. I mean, I'm a sort of slightly clunky policy wonk guy that likes big reports and will read a, report, read a book like that in my Christmas holiday. Um, but there are a lot of people that won't and won't read Human Rights Watch or Amnesty reports of the length that we used to write them. So I think getting people that can tell a compelling story about what a human rights violation means to them and to their life, and find ways to communicate that to much larger groups of people who can potentially be both affected by it, but also energised to do something about it. I think that's hugely important going forward, to think about the communications dimension to our work. I think building, and I put down building broad-based alliances, I'm not sure that changes either. I think maybe the nature of some of our alliances will change. And Joanne talked a lot about the internationalisation thrust, which has been an important part of Amnesty's work, and Human Rights Watch's as well. But I think whoever the alliances are with, the critical importance is to have a very broad base of alliances and organisations that are supporting a cause if you're likely to you know, have any chance of affecting change. Perhaps a fourth and final point about what are the conditions for effective advocacy is long-term commitment and engagement. That's actually harder to do at the country level. We work on countries and we work on thematic issues. And country situations, as we all know, change from, you know, from year to year, from month to month. Uh, Sarah Leah Whitson, if she, if she was here at one point to talk to Sarah, probably said this story, but in 2010, the Middle East Division of Human Rights Watch got together for its you know, retreat and decided it was going to be women's rights across the Middle East that they were working on. And then a few months later, the Arab Spring kicked off, and all of the plans that had been laid about what we were going to work on and how we were going to work and what the projects would be, were going to be were all thrown out of the water because circumstances had changed on the ground. So I think country work is much more necessarily reactive. But I think on thematic work, you can stay committed for a longer term and have some real impact. And give me, let me give you some examples. And again, there may be ones that you don't expect, uh, but I, I think there are real examples of impact that reflect some of these uh, examples of impact and success that I've talked about, or preconditions for impact and success. One is the ILO Convention on the Rights of Domestic Workers. Um, people think, the rights of domestic workers? Who the hell are they? They are cooks, cleaners, nanny, nannies, home helps, drivers... Various estimates around the world. Some people suggest there are 100 million of them working in people's homes and in people's houses. They are some of the most exploited people in the world. And not so long ago, in 2011, uh, the ILO Convention on the Rights of Domestic Workers came into force. It's now been ratified by 28 countries. It's having real impact. There are countries around the world that are putting in place... Not just, they're not just signing up to the international convention. And I know there is a scepticism about whether those international treaties and conventions actually ever amount to anything. But they're actually changing their domestic laws, giving domestic workers, the right to days off, to proper pay, to pension entitlements. I think it's an international convention that has really worked its way down to the national level in a, in a form that had very positive impact. So I would highlight the ILO Convention on the Rights of Domestic Workers as a really good example of human rights impact in recent years. The other is the work that's been done on child labour. So I'm talking a lot about children today, but child labour, where there, since 2000 there has been a one-third reduction uh, in child labour rates around the world which is 100 million less children involved in child labour than would be the case without that reduction. That's a very, very significant change affecting millions of children around the world. Two more examples, which I think are... Very, uh, very quick, Dave. Very briefly. Well, is the work that we've done, and others have done too, on the male guardianship system... And this will be my last case. Okay. The male guardianship system in Saudi Arabia, which, as people may know, means that women and girls have to get the permission of a male relative, a father, a brother, a husband, before they can open a business, get medical assistance, travel, whatever. That is beginning to change. And I think there are a lot of organisations, including Human Rights Watch, that have worked for years on that issue in a way that appears to be having some impact because it looks as if the Saudi authorities will begin finally to change that anomalous and outrageous and discriminatory system. Thank you, David. Joanne. 
I'm going to address the question of pushback, which yeah, is, yeah. I think, a really serious problem today. But, I mean, I guess I'll start by putting in a little bit of historical context and emphasize that there's always been, you know, at every stage of the movement's growth and development, there's been pushback. No, none of the successes of the human rights movement have been given, have been offered up by governments or armed actors. They've all been fought for and they've all been difficult. And the 80s, which was a movement of, I think, you know, great success of human rights and kind of the research and advocacy methodologies that rely on today were really honed during that period. Human rights defenders were maligned as subversives, as communists. Um, by you know, the right-wing governments in Latin America. When they criticized Eastern Bloc countries, they were called CIA fronts and you know, apologists for American imperialism. Um, you know, and, and people were put in jail and killed uh, on the basis of such criticisms. So those kinds of criticisms can be really dangerous. But I think now we're seeing um, what is in some sense possibly more dangerous, which is the degree in which our traditional allies, liberal Western governments, are joining in the chorus of criticism of human rights. Um, and if, you know, Leslie, you kind of opened this discussion, I think your chapter is a very good primer on, on some of this backlash. And, and Leslie coined a phrase, strategic legalism, uh, to describe one aspect of this backlash that I think is quite apt for what we're seeing from the US, where it's not, I mean, I'll, I'm going to kind of outline some of the ways in which the US and other governments are attacking human rights, but sort of the most insidious way is using our tools against us, attacking, trying to redefine norms um, and rejigger the institutions of human rights uh, in order to weaken them. So on the pessimistic side, um, this year, uh, Prince Zaid, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, in December announced that he was going to be resigning from his post because essentially he felt that his position is untenable. He is, um, he spoke of the many trends across the world that seem to negate and deny the value of human rights. And he made kind of an emotional speech last June that presaged his recent announcement that was equally pessimistic, that decried the rise of populism, the, the rise of nativism, uh, the way in which these movements have taken over you know, and succeeded in, in many Western governments, and he you know, particularly spoke about Trump and, and, and the US, um, or at least the Trump administration's attack on, on basic human rights values. Um, he ended his speech saying, what is happening to us? Uh, which I think just, you know, gives an emotional sense of his feeling of pessimism. And as a global spokesman, as kind of the official global spokesman for the human rights movement, that is, I think, you know, worth paying attention to. Um, the developments that he spoke of and that we certainly feel uh, sometimes on a day-to-day -day basis in our work are, one, just increasing explicit criticism of human rights norms, not just attacking you know, certain norms or certain human rights actors, but saying that human rights itself gets in the way of more pressing priorities such as security. Um, obviously, I'm sure you all heard of Trump's explicit defense of torture, saying that it may be necessary in some circumstances. His uh, comments that exemplary extrajudicial executions can be a useful tool in some circumstances. Um, Secretary of State Tillerson suggesting that uh, the promotion of human rights can be an obstacle to the pursuit of more serious and core economic rights concerns or economic uh, interests. Um, this year, Theresa May uh, called for human rights laws to be overturned if they get in the way of the fight against terrorism, echoing some of what we saw during the Bush administration. And of course, in the Philippines, President Duterte has now really broken with past presidents and, and um, you know, broken a taboo of explicitly bragging about human rights violations and the most egregious violations, extrajudicial executions of, of criminal suspects. We've also seen uh, various attempts to nullify and displace human rights law. Um, and you know, most notably, 
the, the efforts of the United States during the war on terror, but you know, continuing efforts to um, carve out a space for counterterrorism efforts to be waged without regard to either human rights or humanitarian law constraints. Um, a, a kind of wide-ranging effort to sabotage the institutional architecture of the human rights movement and you know, specifically the ICC, as, as Leslie's chapter describes, um, you have now the Burundi withdrawal from the ICC, the South African promised withdrawal, and a range of African states and African institutions um, undermining the ICC. You have the US strategy of embedding language in the Security Council resolution that referred the Libya case to the ICC that exempted citizens of non-party states, i.e. the US, from prosecution before the ICC. Uh, you have attacks on other human rights mechanisms. Last year, nine Arab states that belong to the Saudi Arabia coalition that's bombing Yemen um, made an unprecedented threat to withdraw from the UN if they were listed as perpetrators in that list of shame that, that David made reference to. And then finally, and I think you know, most worryingly and most personally, you see really um, a, a wave of attacks on both human rights organizations and human rights defenders. Um, and this is characterized by often new laws, new regulations that, that attack the budgets and funding of human rights organizations, that restrict their activities, that bar them from registering or bar them from being involved in protests. Um, Nearly half of the world's states have passed such laws in recent years, so it's not an isolated problem. And then we're also seeing actual prosecutions of human rights defenders, and for Amnesty, this is something that, that comes really close to home because 11 of our staff are being prosecuted in Turkey, um, including the chair of Amnesty Turkey, who was arrested last June and charged and still in prison for the supposed crime uh, really the baseless accusation of being a member of an armed terrorist group. So um, they face prison terms of up to 15 years. This is, is, is really very serious and, and the next hearing in the case will be at the end of this month. But these are the kinds of attacks, this is the kind of backlash that the human rights movement is facing now. Thank you, John. And Leslie. Um, I'm very depressed. Uh, I, I mean, those are terrific comments and very important and not wrong. Uh, I guess uh, I've now changed what I was going to say. I'm going to be very brief because I really want to hear from so many people in the audience. But let me just say quickly, I think it's, I think it's very hard to know how things will work out. I, there is no end point, so this is, you know, forever a, a, a space for contestation, pushback, progressive change, all sorts of things going on. Uh, but just a few almost, just uh, rather than a big point, let me just make a few comments and then we can maybe come back to big points in the Q&A. It's not clear to me that, uh, uh, this is not an indefense of Donald Trump, promise, I promise you, but just analytically, it's not clear where Donald Trump stands on human rights. Look at his comments on Iran, uh, you know, he's supporting, uh, we're, I'm not going to say anything about why, it's complicated and we can be very cynical, however, pushing for the protests, talk, talk, talking about you know, the abuse of human rights um, in Iran, making a big speech in Seoul about North Korea's human rights program. Donald Trump certainly uses the language of human rights promotionally in certain cases for reasons that have to do with his other strategic uh, or tactical goals or the, the policies that he's trying to push at that particular point in time. And some, to a certain extent, that doesn't differ from other leaders. But there are times when he is actually using the human rights language. He hasn't completely abandoned it. It's complicated. Um, and then I guess the thing I would say about domestically in the West, and especially in the US, but in, the West, in Europe and the US, um, yes, we're very fixated on, on a conservative mobilization and backlash. But you know, the United States is not Donald Trump. It's quite extraordinary, the level of mobilization from civil society in response to the Muslim ban, time one, two, and three, in response to the withdrawal from Paris. The pushback has not only been from civil society, it's been from cities, it's been from states. 
It's been from corporates. It's been from university presidents. It's been from Michael Bloomberg. It's been from John Kerry. It's been quite extraordinary, and the, and the verdict is definitely still out. And unfortunately, I think that uh, the media in the UK has done a very poor job of covering the broader contestation that's going back, if that, that's going on in the United States. Um, it's been better in the UK, but not terrific. It is a highly divided country. The US is highly divided. It's highly, highly partisan, but it's not moved to the right. It's moved towards division. Um, and so the, the left is very, very strong, as is the right. That's what's, that's what's disturbing, perhaps. But contestation is extraordinary. And if you watched the reactions to the violence in Charlottesville, and especially to the president's response um, to the violence in Charlottesville from the private sector, it was quite remarkable and, you know, pro um, anti-racism, pro-human rights. So I think that it's, it's a much more complex picture, and then for that reason, I think that, it's, it's not in, that we're not in an inevitable state of decline. Um, but there's lots more to say, but I won't say it now. Okay, thank you, Leslie. Jack. So uh, I want to start with the question of impact. One of the things that really struck me across our 15 different contributors to the book who had very different views on almost everything was that they tended to agree uh, quite convergently on the question of impact of uh, what makes a country have good or not so good uh, human rights. And they agreed to the following list of scope conditions, which has emerged from various forms of social science research. Number one is you have good human rights if the country is at peace. Number two is if it's a democracy. Number three, a bit further down, is per capita income. The scope conditions continue with well, sometimes if the country is, the state is too strong, like in China, you can't pressure it and so it can have bad human rights. But sometimes if the state is too weak, like Somalia, there's no state to put pressure on and human rights suffer. Uh, the condition that people agreed was the one where human rights activism, the standard formula of sign a treaty, hold the, the signer uh, accountable and apply universal standards, that that has the greatest impact, uh, Beth Simmons' book shows, in, in countries that are already partly democratic, that already have partly independent legal systems, uh, and, and when they sign a treaty and that system kicks in, then it allows civil society actors space to mobilize, the legitimacy to mobilize, and it allows the courts to be a venue for litigation. But that's a particular slice of the countries. That does not include the horrible authoritarian, rights abusing, uh, worst offenders. And it struck me that there was a lot of agreement on that. There was way less agreement in general on whether the shaming tactics of human rights organizations work or not. You know, I'll, most people don't like it when they're shamed. And as Leslie was saying, they tend to push back. And so the most prominent uh, article on this subject in uh, social science finds that one of the most common things that happens if, you, if you're shamed for doing one thing, you'll try to hide it or stop doing that, but do some other bad thing that allows you to repress the opposition uh, in some other way that isn't getting shamed yet. Um, so we, we should also remember, and so the, the question of child labor has been brought up, that sometimes the kinds of outcomes that human rights proponents want can be brought about by ways that are not normally thought of as human rights mechanisms. So the two countries in the 20th century that most rapidly reduced child labor were 
China under Deng Xiaoping and Tanzania under the single party uh, state. And in both cases, a, a big part of it was providing uh, good quality, universal, free public education. Uh, and in the Chinese case, it had to do with the change in uh, the economy, which gave parents the ability and the incentive to keep their kids in school. It had you know, nothing to do with what we normally think of as the human rights repertoire of methods. So uh, just let me close with my second point about alternatives to the standard uh, way of approaching human rights. Uh, as David, thank you, mentioned, my argument in my chapter is uh, that politics needs to come first and justice and rights follows. Um, that uh, this is so when, when you ask Arie Nair, the founder of Human Rights Watch, uh, what he looks to as a lodestar to guide uh, the strategy of human rights promotion, he says, look back to the iconic cases, uh, anti-slavery, uh, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and uh, so he, but he interprets this as the success of relentlessly moralistic advocacy and unyieldingness uh, it, and no compromise with the perpetrators. But if you look at those cases, uh, all three of those cases uh, were instances where they were mass movements. They were not just a handful of unyielding principled human rights act uh, activists, but there were mass movements where many of the people were demanding uh, these rights in their own self-interest. Uh, they were um, not only a mass movement, but they were all associated with a progressive political party that could win votes and make deals. And they were all backed by religious ideas and religious networks. And I think that um, th this uh, tripod of progressive political party, mass uh, social movement, plus the principled activists is something to think about in, in, in the future in uh, constructing political coalitions that will give the political power behind the human rights movement that it has sometimes lacked. Thank you, Jack. Okay, let's take a few questions. I think there's a microphone. Question down here. Be very quick, please, so we can get a few questions in. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Hashim. I'm from the Iraqi Democratic Movement. Uh, it's a political group, but obviously, given the nature of uh, situation in Iraq, our work always come back to human rights. Uh, Mike, I, it was interesting to listen to the distinguished uh, speakers from the human rights uh, organizations talking about uh, the, the changes that the movement is going through to become more effective, uh, as I understand it. Uh, Jane talked about uh, diversifying uh, the staff and uh, opening offices, etc. Both spoke about partners. My question is, uh, wouldn't it be much better and more effective strategy if you focus on facilitating the work of those human rights activists in their countries because they are the front line. Uh, with all due respect, you are not. Your big bronze, you can be seen in all the big meetings, you have access to decision makers, you can use that 
to help and support and facilitate the work of the local human rights activists because there is no question that that would give you more credibility and that would help, and I think one of the speakers spoke about it, help the local activists to actually better their, their activities and their work and be more effective. Wouldn't that be a better strategy than actually following the model of, it may sound harsh, the church when they have a few brown and black faces, bishops, uh, to, to, to change the image. Okay. That's not going to change it. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, I'm going to ask you to hold so we take a few questions and then I'll give everybody a chance to make a final comment. Who's next? Oh, right up the back there. You're going to have to... Oh, we've got another microphone over there. Okay, great. If you put your hands up um, while I, uh, the question's being asked... Thank you for your talks. One thing which hasn't been mentioned is the rise of non-state actors uh, wielding power, not just corporate entities, but also regional movements. Many, many, many states are now under the control of no particular power. Uh, many companies run states. Um, how would that, how would that uh, affect human rights in the future? Uh, this is not just a matter of globalization and rising corporate power and neoliberalism, but essentially more and more uh, power is moving away from politics and human rights has always been affected by a symbiotic relationship with the state. It relies on the state to enforce human rights. It critiques the uh, state for not enforcing human rights. Uh, and what will be the challenge in future with non-state actors? Okay, great, thank you. There's a question right behind you, the gentleman in the pink or orange shirt. Yeah. Thank you. Um, question to uh, Joanne, or anyone else can take it on diversification. Um, how would this like surface level diversification help us uh, bring in, uh, attention to the subjectivity of human rights uh, in that um, human rights may be uh, perceived to be a Eurocentric Leo Canolio endeavor and uh, Leslie pointed out that the language of human rights is weaponized by neoconservatives such as Donald Trump in the same way that Bush did so to uh, invade Iraq. Um, the diversification Joanne that you mentioned uh, first of all uh, in terms of intellectual skills you, you said that there should be more architects, uh, military forensic experts to uh, add to the lawyers these are all objective fields they can't point out for example what professor snyder pointed out um you know uh, he's obviously a leader in, in political science and ir fields that deal in uh, uh, subjectivity he saw that diversification that you mentioned the cultural diversification you mentioned to fight this white savior complex he found it to be useless because the 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 middle easterners that he came across in amman uh, they were subscribing to uh, Western Eurocentric liberal thought. So, how 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 are we gonna like um, bring attention to the whole subjectivity of the idea of human rights, especially considering that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948? I mean, there was no voice for uh, conservative Islam. There was no voice for Africa. Uh, there was no voice for uh, the Far East. And these are usually the regions that are most likely to be accused of abusing human rights. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, could, maybe we could stop at this point and go to the okay, next Okay, can I take one more question? There's just someone at the back there. I'm going to take one more question, then I'm going to let you come back. Thank you. Um, yeah, actually, this is a bit of a continuation of the previous question, but like speaking along the lines of the subjectivity, like just going to the core of the cultural relativism of like what the human rights paradigm was conceived to be and what it is now and how it is weaponized. Um, I obviously haven't looked at the book yet, but um, it, it, was there any discussion at all in terms of like re kind of um, considering like what human rights would mean in a plural or non-Western way? And do you see that as a productive tool to maybe not be so pessimistic about uh, the future of human rights? Okay, that's a great question. Okay, thank you very much. I'll, Jack, would you, would you or, uh, maybe I'll let Joanne and David go first because they got yeah. the lion's share of the question. Okay, yeah. so Joanne, okay? Okay, yeah. Um, first, your point is well taken, but I, I want to reassure you that is our operating, the, the way we operate. We work extremely closely with local groups, always when we visit a country, if we're not already based in the country, 
the first people we meet with our local groups. We often bring representatives of local human rights groups to government meetings with us, to UN meetings with us. You know, often they get access because of working with us that they haven't gotten before. As you suggest, it's, you know, they are the ones that are putting their lives on the line much more than we are. Um, but we absolutely recognize that, and we also invite them on visits to often the U.S. or Europe and bring them into the offices. I mean, I'm sure, David, that's a big part yep. of your work, bringing yep. people into the foreign office, um, bringing them, introducing them to influential media, um, you know, journalists and so forth. So we, you know, we agree with you and we are doing that. Um, on non-state actors, again, a really important point, and one, if you look at um, our website, you can see, and Human Rights Watch's website as well, you can see we have a growing body of work on corporate abuses and corporate complicity in abuses. Um, you're right, the traditional focus of the human rights movement, and if you look at the you know, UN treaties and so forth, is constraining the power of state actors, but more and more, obviously, the world um, is, you know, the, the, the abuses that we see in the world are very much um, done by and influenced by corporate actors, and we are uh, changing the focus of our work to take that into account. On um, human rights as perceived as being a neo colonial endeavor um, and the need or you know what is the impact of diversification on that I think uh, you know people may have different formal skills but their backgrounds as well their subjective backgrounds influence their views of how human rights should be implemented and um, how human rights compliance um, can be affected and so I mean Pardon me, David, for another Human Rights no, Watch okay. example, but I mean, I was privy to a lot of discussions at Human Rights Watch about the need or, you know, instances in which we might be advocating for humanitarian intervention. And I saw a clear difference between people from the Global South who are just, in general, much more skeptical about U.S. power and the motivations behind U.S. power because let's be honest, when we're talking about humanitarian intervention, we're talking about Western intervention in the Global South. So those debates were often very heated, and I would say um, the voices of those non-Western actors, those human rights activists from the Global South was crucial in those debates. Thank you. David, very quickly, please. Uh, yeah, I don't have a lot to add. I think I, think I agree with all three comments and responses that Joanne gave. I mean, it, it's also our operating model. If you don't think that's working in the case of Iraq, we should talk afterwards, but we've got, uh, that's very much the approach that we adopt at Human Rights Watch, of working with human rights defenders, human rights activists, trying to give them the space to operate effectively in their own countries and obviously taking very much a lead from them in terms of how we should approach the government. In terms of non-state actors, I think you had a term for it in the book. Was it, was it limited sovereignty or was the qualified sovereignty? There was a specific term in one of the chapters about yeah. where the writ of the, gov of the central government doesn't extend yeah. throughout the country. Yeah. Yeah. Limited statehood. Sorry? Limited state. Limited state. Thomas Rissa's chapter. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a, a very common phenomenon. You know, we tend to have this assumption that there is a central government that has, has a Vivarian state which can act, exercise power throughout the whole country and where the writ of the central government runs. And often that doesn't, doesn't happen. Uh, I'm not sure it's the quite necessarily the case that the corporations are kind of taking over the running of bits of a state. Uh, certainly we have a strong uh, corporate accountability program at Human Rights Watch as well, and there's a lot of stuff on that on our website which you should go to. But I think there's perhaps a slightly more challenging issue about where, say in Pakistan, the central government wants to make something happen in Northwest Frontier Province but simply is incapable of making it happen. And I think that poses very big challenges for, for the human rights movement. Uh, for, you know, where there are human rights abuses happening in those parts of the state. And I don't really agree with really what everything Joanne okay. said in response to the, to the final question. So thank, I'll add thank you, David. Okay, Leslie wants No, I'd just love to hear more from the audience, but I just want I didn't say that Donald Trump was a neoconservative. That's... <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jack. So on the question of whether human rights are somehow just subjective, um, I don't think so. Uh, so... The, um, except for oil producing states and Singapore, no country has ever made it out of the middle income trap without adopting the full panoply of civil and political and rule of law rights. 
there's something uh, of an objective social fact about human rights and how they function in modern societies that if you try to get around that, uh, you'll pay a price. And so I see them as having uh, objectivity. Okay. Thank you, Jack. Thank you all very much. I want to make two announcements. First of all, there's a reception outside and we're selling books. You, you know that. Um, secondly, uh, there's a, an exhibition opening tonight, which is entirely opposite to our discussion, uh, called Legacies of Biafra. It's in the Brunei Gallery, where you came in. You just, rather than turn left, you go straight on. They've agreed to keep that exhibition open for half an hour extra. It's an extraordinary exhibition. So please, on your way out, pop in there. Uh, it's free. Just have a look at some of the um, photographs and some of the material there. Thank you very much to our panelists, and thank you all for